Kenny. Kenny is uh, President and CEO of ACT Research and uh, one of the foremost prognosticators on our industry, and he's going to tell us where we're at and where we're going. So please, Hi. yes. Yeah, I mentioned that you were in the back of the room. 1115 bus out here, okay? 1115 bus. Thank you. Yeah, Charlie. Yep. Uh, thanks, Charlie. And, uh, and good morning, everyone. So, so when I did get in, Charlie, I, I, I did see the, you know, the schedule on, uh, that, was, that, that came in our package, and it, it said, uh, you know, presenting at, at 8.30, uh, coffee break at 8.45. So I was like, <laughs> I've, got, I've got way too many slides. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, what I'm going to do today is, is uh, you know, talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, what's happened in, in the immediate past. Uh, look a little bit about uh, you know where we are in the economy. Uh, talk uh, transition that to to uh, freight and the trucking environment. You know how are how are your customers doing? Uh, then then look at some of our trailer model outputs. Uh, talk about the current market environment and then get into forecasts. And and uh, you know Charlie will be giving me the five minute sign when I've got about ten minutes of presentation left. So uh, so so uh, uh, I will I will be chased off the stage with a broom. So, so, you know, just, just starting at where we are right now, and, and, and shortly after the election, and if you think back um, August, September, October last year, it was pretty rough for trailer orders. You know, the industry was still building a lot of trailers. Uh, backlogs were okay, but they were coming down rapidly. Cancellations had spiked, and, and uh, you know, we were, we were cutting our trailer forecasts uh, you know, through the third quarter and into the beginning of the fourth quarter. We have the election, and all of a sudden, everybody wants a trailer, everybody wants a truck. And you can see uh, the, the, the rate of change uh, for medium-duty trucks, uh, for Class 8 vocational trucks, up about 20% each uh, year-to-date this year compared to the fourth quarter. Those are seasonally adjusted rates. Uh, we try to balance these things out. You know, tractors up 42%. And our models say there are way too many tractors on the road. Uh, class A or complete trailers. And I use a little bit different calculation because the trailer cycle is a, is, is a little bit different, but up 44% in a, in a similar period. And, and we look around, you know, what changed? Uh, you know, the freight's a little bit better. The comps, at least especially for Class 8, are easy, you know, because, because Class 8 was really uh, in the ditch before the order started. Uh, but typically, what we see is, and, and, and you know, the, the hard part in our business is the back end of the cycle. When is it going to roll over? Because you're always surprised on the back end. The front end is typically very predictable. Uh, you know, you get un industrial production to pick up, then you see trucker freight or tr trucker profits pick up, and then a couple quarters later, you get orders. So what we saw at the beginning of this year is Donald Trump got elected, and we got orders. So, so you know, our question is, is, is what we have seen sustainable? And, and that's what we'll talk about. Or, or, you know, and, and I don't think I, at the end of this presentation, you're going to say, well, Kenny didn't give us the answer. Is this sustainable? And, and that's because... Kenny's not really sure about that right now. So, so uh, you know, you've, again, t typically we get the freight, we get the profits, and then we get the orders and we get the demand. So here we've just gone to orders. And, and there are things that are good that are happening in the economy, but are they going to be enough? Because we're seeing a lot of affiliated industries. Uh, rental, we've had a few, huge explosion in rental orders. Uh, ag, ag orders are up. And I don't know, I, I live in the middle of a cornfield. I can tell you my neighbors are not making any money for a fourth consecutive year. But tractor orders are up like crazy. So, and, and we're seeing it, you know, we're, again, we're seeing it a lot of, you know, construction-related industries, uh, you know, betting on the come. So, so if it doesn't happen, then, then you know, does this fall off? So, so but I, I digress here. Uh, so, so um, you know, there will be a quiz on this uh, after the presentation. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, hopefully you can see the colors. And this is, is the last 14 months. Uh, this is our Class 8 tractor lead indicator dashboard. And, and there's 15 metrics, five econ economic, five freight, and five 
industry metrics and, and we, we just take an aggregate tally uh, that's you know, our green minus red tally at the very top. And you can see March 2016 on the far left hand side is, is minus seven, uh, you know, minus eight, minus nine, uh, you know, minus 10 in July and August 2016. There's only 15 variables, and we're getting a minus 10. You know, this is this is bad stuff. And we go along, and and you know, things are starting to turn at the end of the year. Uh, so October minus eight, November minus four, December plus minus two, and and some of that going from minus eight to minus two is Donald Trump. The uh, the Dow Jones Trucking Stock Index is the uh, is the is the fifth number down. Uh, you can see it turns positive in November. Uh, and you can see where we've been since. So, so compared to where we were last, last year, you know, March minus 7, April minus 8, you know, look where we are this year, uh, March plus 1, April plus 3. So things are better. But typically, this is a, a leading indicator dashboard. So what we would expect is six months after we start getting green on here, we would get the orders. So we would be expecting to get the orders in the second half of the year, again, not the first half of the year. So turning to the economy, what, what is good? And consumers are good. You know, there, there's the, the, the job creation trend has been great. Uh, you know, the main number was a little bit disappointing, but I think over the past year, uh, we've added about 2.4 million jobs. Uh, you know, the replacement rate's about 1.5, so we've, you know, put 900,000 900, more people to work at this time this year than there were last year. The quit rate, is, is still a little bit elevated, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still above, say, the 2004, 2005 level, but, but you know, it's good. Um, income growth is good. And also, there's still a few too many people that are working part-time that would like to be working full-time. So you know, there's still a little, maybe a little slack in the labor market that belies uh, the 4.3% unemployment rate, but, but still pretty good stuff all in all. Um, Underlying housing demand, you know, there, there, is, there is pent up demand, or I would argue there's pent up demand right now uh, in the number of household creations we've seen over the last seven or eight years once we got through the housing bubble. Uh, and and I, I would say there's pent up demand for new housing stock in the United States. And actually there was just an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, last year was the first time in, in 15 or 16 years. Uh, that the square footage of houses being built in the United States actually came down, and it was incremental. It was like, you know, down like 2%, but it suggests that some more starter homes are starting to be built. Uh, big ticket consumer items, very well. You know, we had the housing bubble in, you know, 2003 to say 2007. Uh, you know, think of all the appliances that were put into service 13, 14, 15 years ago. There's, there's a lot of microwaves and dishwashers and stoves and refrigerators that need to be replaced. So, so good underlying uh, you know, demand for consumer stuff. And, and again, consumers are making good money right now. We've seen a rebound in commodity prices, and it's so important for, for freight. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the commodity guys um, buy a lot of machinery. You know, if you're, you're extracting stuff, uh, you, you need machines to extract stuff. Well, we had the, the global commodity bubble pop in, in the middle of 2014. Uh, these guys haven't made any money for the past two years. Therefore, they haven't bought any machinery for the past two years. We're starting to see some improvement in commodity prices, maybe a little bit of pent-up demand there. But at a minimum, uh, some, some of these guys, you know, the, the, the oil fields uh, you know, would, would be a great example. Are, are starting to buy some equipment. I think Schlumberger bought, uh, you know, had an order in, in February for a thousand trucks. You know, just oil field services guys. Uh, pneumatic tank trailers, uh, you, know, you know, granted a good year in pneumatic tank trailers is like 2,000 units. Uh, but we just took our forecast for pneumatics from 1,300 units to 1,700 units. That's how strong we've seen orders in the last three or four months. Uh, so, so yeah, if, if you make valves and fittings, you're probably like saying, man, this is really good. Uh, business confidence, along with consumer confidence, has, has soared. And, and it's one of these things that we can point to Donald Trump, uh, you know, the election of Donald Trump, and, and business confidence uh, is, is, is through the roof. Uh, interest rates are, are, are modest. Inflation is still modest. And the, the stock market is, is very good, unless, like me, uh, you own a bunch of trucking stocks, and, and it's, it's been disappointing the last 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, so on, on the not-so-good side, uh, the U.S. dollar is strong. 
and, and it's very difficult for U.S. exporters to compete in the global market. And, and you're part of the problem, uh, you know, why is the U.S. Uh, you know, dollar strong? It's, uh, you know, we are, we are still kind of, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the bastion of safety in the world. Um, you know, we have uh, higher interest rates than a lot of other countries are yielding, and, and uh, you know, it's an attractive place uh, to, to park your money. Geopolitical risk, you know, whether it's, whether it's North Korea, whether it's the South China, China Sea, the last two days, Qatar has, uh, has, has been flashing up in the news. Uh, you know, it it's, uh, you know, seems to be, you know, all around the world and, and very disappointing. Um, you know, we, yeah, anyway, we can, we can stop there. Autos are slowing. Uh, you know, we've had a great five-year run on auto. And we're not thinking, you know, auto is going to roll over and, and, and fall off a cliff. But, uh, you know, building cars generates a lot of freight. Uh, and, and when you have a lot of freight, you need trucks, you need trailers. And, and, and so, you know, we're, we're looking at, at, at seeing that market go from, you know, say a 17 million unit rate uh, down to, you know, a mid-16s type rate. So, so a little bit of a correction there. Uh, domestic political storms and stagnation, you know, just, just wake up and read the tweets every morning. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it is tough. Uh, and, and, and it's, you know, certainly discouraging from an economist perspective. And, and then presidential leadership. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, whether, whether it's on taxes or, or regulations or, or infrastructure, um, you know, I, I think the president is saying, you know, make it happen, but he's not giving any guidance. You know, he's, he's not being the guy uh, to drive the process. And, and, and again, uh, you know, the process, you know, certainly in the first 150 days or so, not a lot has gotten accomplished. Uh, with the exception of executive orders, and and I think that's that kind of we you know we need, you know we we, we need more leadership from the president. That's uh, at least my opinion, uh, and I will leave that alone for the uh, for the rest of the day. <coughs> and, and then and then Federal Reserve rate hikes, and and we'll talk about this, but but uh, um, we have a very low growth threshold for inflation, uh, and 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 again I'll I'll touch on this uh, here briefly. Just lead indicators in. So far, this is, this is, I think, my fourth slide, and I'm already like 10 minutes in, uh, which, which is a bad indicator. Uh, but, but uh, you know, this is my fourth slide, and this is the third one with words. I promise there are pictures coming. Uh, so, so uh, you know, wh wh what do we look at for, for lead indicators? Uh, first, the yield curve. The yield curve, uh, the spread between long-term interest rates and short-term interest rates is the best predictor of recessions of, of just about any indicator that I can think of. Uh, the Purchasing Managers Index, it, it, is a, uh, it, it has been very good for the past six to eight months, and, and it is a precursor to industrial activity. Uh, commodity prices, we've already touched on commodity prices. Uh, stock market, doing very well. And, and Wall Street is, is an uncanny beast that sees into the future whether we are going to be doing better or worse in the next 12 months. And you know, again, there's that, that old joke that you know, Wall Street has predicted nine of the last five recessions. Uh, but, but beyond that, the, these guys, uh, you know, stock prices are looking at where things are, you know, the, the valuation, today's valuations are where Wall Street expects the world to be in 12 months. So you know, if you look around, uh, look at the stock indexes, Wall Street expects things to be pretty good 12 months from now. And then, uh, you know, confidence surveys, and I, I, I've got a picture for that. Uh, so, so uh, you know, for, for, you know, my message to Strick is when your, when your suppliers come to you and say, we need more money, and, and my message to the dealers when, when Strick says to you, well, the trailers are going to cost more. Um, this, this chart has a little bit of that, that answer to it. So, so this is, these are, you know, some, some, some commodity prices. You know, first I've got oil and oil rigs. And you can see that a year ago we had about 350 oil rigs in operation in the United States. Today it's about 700. You know, all other things being equal, there's probably about twice as many pieces of equipment operating around 700 oil rigs than there was a year ago at 350. So, so taking incremental capacity out of the marketplace and putting it to work. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, in the middle here, that's uh, copper prices. And uh, you can see, uh, you know, October, November, and, uh, you know, where we are from, from 220 to about 250, flattening out. 
Uh, iron prices, you know, kind of a, a swag for steel, uh, doing pretty well. Uh, aluminum prices, uh, you know, have, have, you know, from, from December uh, to, to where they are in April, uh, very nice run in aluminum prices. And, and so what this means is, you know, the copper guys are going to start investing, the steel guys are going to invest, the aluminum guys, the oil guys are all going to invest. They buy machines, machines are freight. Manufacturing PMIs, this is another one, uh, you know, not so much the detail, but, uh, but, but, you know, looking at the color as it changes as we go across the page. And, and you can see, uh, you know, Europe is extremely strong right now. Uh, North America is, is doing much better. And, and even some of the dogs, uh, you know, like Brazil, uh, like Southeast Asia, have, have really turned around uh, over the last 12 months. So, so the global economy is, is doing much better. Uh, small business optimism, uh, you can see, uh, you know, the jump that we had here in November uh, and, and, a, and a, a monster jump here in December, and it's really been sustained uh, for the past four months. So, and, and uh, you know, the only thing we can say is, is what changed from October uh, to November is, is Donald Trump got elected. So this is the third lo longest economic expansion in U.S. history. Uh, my wife would refer to it as the Obama economic miracle. Uh, but but uh, uh, next June, this will be the second longest expansion in U.S. history. And in the middle of 2019, this will become the longest expansion in U.S. economic history. And we fully believe that we see no reason for the economy to roll over really any time in the next five years. Uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Fed had a very nice paper at the, uh, you know, kind of in early 2016 talking about economic expansions and the probability for recession. And, and their, their, their uh, quote is up there, but, but you know, to, to put it into English, it's uh, economic expansions do not die of old age. Of course, what the Fed didn't say is usually the Fed murders economic expansions. And, and that is, uh, and, 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 you know, based on age, only on age, an 80-month expansion has effectively the same chance of ending as a 40-month-old expansion. So, so uh, you know, what usually kills economic cycles is, is bad monetary policy. Uh, not raising rates soon enough, creating inflation, which causes harder, harder monetary policy decisions later, uh, which choke off economic demand for big ticket goods and you cycle the economy. That's, that's the way these things usually end. Uh, the Fed is being, you know, very judicious right now. Um, and, and again, as, as long as they're being judicious, I, I don't see where the, where the pressure or where that, that, that monetary policy driven cycling of the economy is going to occur at least for the next several years. So yield spread, uh, I, I talked about uh, the, the, the spread between long and short rates. So, you know, the, 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 the blue area on this chart is the gap between one-year and 10-year treasuries. If we're above the zero line, that's good. When we go below the zero line, that's bad. And, and just think of it conceptually. Uh, bankers borrow money at short-term rates, and they lend money at long-term rates. So if the yield spread is wide, you know, so right now we're, we're at about 135 basis points. So, so you know, just, just conceptually, if I'm a banker, I borrow money at, uh, you know, 0.5% and I lend at, you know, 1.8%. So, so I, I have a positive cash flow. The problem is when the yield curve inverts, that, that's when short rates go above long rates. And, and so now the banker is like, yeah, but I don't want to lend money because I'm not going to make any money on the transaction. And, and, and so you notice, the, so the orange bars on this chart are quarters in which the U.S. economy had a negative GDP. And you can see uh, in the case of, of every time you have a yield curve inversion, not too long after that pipeline of projects drains, bankers aren't lending money, and you have a recession. And so we've got a wide positive yield curve right now and, and, and a, a, a Fed that is being very judicious in monetary policy behavior right now. One thing that is incrementally troubling is we had 
1.6% GDP growth last year. And if you look at uh, overall inflation, inflation went from about 1% to about 2.5% on 1.6% GDP growth. And, and this is uh, my, my, you know, under my you know, concerns. A and that is, we've got population growth right now at about 70, 70 basis points a year, about 7 tenths of 1%. Uh, we've got productivity growth at about 30 basis points, or, or 3 tenths of 1%. So collectively, that adds up to about 1%. Um, typically, the non-inflationary speed limit of the economy is the percent change in population growth plus the percent change in productivity growth. So we can't grow really fast without generating inflation. And when we generate inflation, we know what the Fed does. The Fed starts getting active in the economy. So you know, one of the things that, that, that is incrementally concerning, and I suppose we can all deal with it later, is if we get big tax breaks, if we get a big infrastructure program, in an economy with very low levels of unemployment, and, and you know, I think you know, most of the people that are unemployed can't pass a drug test. Just, that's just a, 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 an opinion statement on, on, my, on my part. Uh, but but uh, you know, th there's not a lot of slack in the U.S. economy right now. So if we stimulate the U.S. economy right now, we're going to ramp inflation and the Fed is going to get busy. And, and then we can start saying in three years, in four years, there's a likelihood of a recession. So uh, that's, that's you know, one of those, you know, it's, 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 it's like uh, first world problems. You know, the, the econ economic growth is too good. What do we do? Um, so, so turning to freight, uh, you know, it's hitting it better. It's, it's, it's still flattish. So just, uh, you know, just kind of a, you know, e uh, a freight 101. Uh, and, and that is not all econo sectors of the economy create freight at the same rate. So manufacturing, uh, you know, if, 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 if I'm building a machine, uh, you know, all the suppliers, all you guys in the room, uh, you know, you have to, well, we use Strick as building a trailer. So all you, all you guys in the room that are supplying, you have to get, you, you have to get commodities or, or, or uh, supplies uh, from, from your, you know, second tier and third tier guys. So, and they have to get parts. It's kind of Adam Smith's invisible hand at work here. Uh, but, but there's a, there's a, a freight flow that goes from the third to the second to the first tier supplier to the OEM and then to the warehouse and, and then, then to the sale. Uh, you know, if I look at, uh, you know, a con consumer, uh, uh, you know, consumer non-durables, um, you know, I would say the vast majority of this clo the clothing being worn in this room today was probably made in Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, so what we're wearing came in a container, came to L.A. Long Beach, got put on a train, went to Chicago. Uh, truck hasn't touched it yet. Uh, you know, it, it gets picked up at the, at the intermodal yard goes to a, uh, a distribution center, then goes to a fulfillment center, or goes to a retail location. Uh, so a truck only touches that twice. And if I talk about uh, you know, consumer spending on, on services, uh, you know, I can go to the doctor or go to the lawyer and, and spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and create you know, virtually zero freight. So, so anyway, uh, you know, what do, what, why do we pay attention to energy, to construction, to industrial production, to capital goods, to machinery? It's because they generate a lot of freight. It's a small piece of the economy, generates outsized amounts of freight. And we do think also, at the end of 2017, we have the electronic logging device mandate. We think that's gonna take about 3.5% of capacity out of the market uh, by getting rid of logbook cheating. We don't think it's, it's like, it's, it's not gonna be like a cliff event, but over the course of 2018, we think capacity is taken out of the market as logbook cheating is eliminated. So our favorite freight metric is the ATA's truck loads index. And this is, this is one of those things that flies in the face of what we've been seeing on the order side. And, and you can see, uh, you know, our, our, uh, so in 2016, uh, the ATA's truck loads index grew 0.1%. Year to date this year, it's grown 0%. And it didn't grow that well in 2015. Again, we had the popping of the commodity bubble in, in the third quarter of 2014, and we just haven't had a lot of manufacturing activity uh, since then. 
This is uh, data from DAT, and I, and I really like that this is, this is become, becoming a new favorite of mine, if you will. Uh, this is the rate spread uh, between contract and spot rates. This is an aggregate number, so we, we take dry reefer and flatbed data and roll it all into one. So, so the blue line is contract, the red line is spot, the green bars down at the bottom uh, of, the, of the page are, are that, that gap between those two rates. You can see that, that on average that rate spread is typically about 18 cents and you can see that in April it was 25 cents. So still uh, kind of a slushy reading in, in the freight rate market. If we see, you know, if you go back to say, you know, 2011 when the market took off, you had this, uh, you know, kind of 10, 12, 14 cent type number. Again, 2014 when the market, especially the class eight market got hot, it was that, you know, kind of 10, 12, 14 type of number as opposed to, uh, you know, kind of 25 to 30 ish. And, and then the stock market, you know, so, so uh, everybody was convinced, you know, it's going to get better, uh, you know, we're going to get an infrastructure program, machinery's going to come back, everything's good. So in November, and again, this is a, a uh, you know, this is, this is truly a Trump phenomenon. Uh, so there's, there's the, uh, you know, stock prices at, at, at you know, 0% in November. You know, by the time we get to February, up 24% on a year-over-year -year basis. And, I, and again, I said, uh, you know, the, the stock market is predicting 12 months in advance. So everybody was pretty fired up about the trucking industry. And in part, because the trucking industry is ordering so many trucks primarily, because capacity in the industry is measured on how many Class 8 trucks there are, not how many trailers there are. So I say Class 8 tractors there are, not how many trailers there are. Uh, but, 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 you know, the, the Class 8 tractor orders went up. And, uh, and, and, and stock prices came down. So, you know, still positive at, at about plus 7%, uh, but, but where, uh, you know, the trucks stocks were, uh, you know, double the rate of improvement relative to the S&P, uh, now it's half the rate of improvement relative to the S&P. Uh, heavy duty productivity, uh, you know, we, these trends continue, uh, they, they remain in place. We, we continue to see uh, strong density. Uh, we continue to see strong utilization trends. Uh, and, and, and what that means basically is, is fewer trucks are required to do the same amount of work. Uh, so our chart, uh, you know, so this is, this is all, of our, uh, all, all of our productivity uh, pieces that go into the model. If you just follow the black line, uh, you know, what our chart says is relative to, you know, say pre-recession, 2006, 2007, um, we are using about 200,000 less Class 8 tractors today to haul the, the freight in the, had, had, we, had we kept kind of the same rules uh, and, and, and uh, you know, that, that were in existence, say in 2006, 2007, uh, to today, we would need 200,000 more Class 8 trucks and, and, and I would say an, at least an equivalent number or, you know, uh, uh, even more trailers uh, to be hauling the freight. So this is this is this is kind of the net freight. So so it's uh, the the blue part is freight growth, uh, the red part is productivity growth. Not seen in there is uh, is is, uh, is is regulatory impacts like the hours of service regulation in the middle of 2013, or uh, well I guess it's included in I should say, uh, or the the electronic logging device mandate, uh, which is why we think we have negative productivity uh, netting out in 2018 why we had negative productivity in 2014, because we had regulations that made it harder for truckers to truck. And I would, I would, I would put forth that regulations that make it harder for truckers to truck, while the truckers will scream bloody murder about them, they're actually very good for trucker profitability. As you build barriers to entry, it makes it harder for little guys to come into the market. It allows the bigger guys to increase their profit margins. And, and we've seen this, uh, you know, over the past 20 years. If I go back to the mid-90s, uh, you know, peak profitability was, was 4%. If I go to, uh, you know, the mid-2000s, uh, mid peak profitability for truckers was about 5.5%. Uh, in 2015, peak profitability was about 6.2%. Uh, for the guys that we track. So, so you know, it's, it's again, uh, the, 
grousing and moaning and, and recognizing that it, nobody wants their jobs to be harder. You know, certainly we get that. But, but there is a reward for these guys. But, but, I, but I digress. And, and, and the, 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 you know, the important point here is in the last two years, if we take freight growth and subtract productivity growth, we've had virtually no activity uh, or no improvement in, in freight. Tractor population is, is, you know, the problem here, of course, is in 2015, uh, we added about 5% to the tractor population in a period of no freight growth. I think this chart really sums it up well. Um, so, 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 what we, so, so this scatter plot here, uh, you know, what, what we're looking at is we've got carry, pro carrier profitability on the x-axis. Uh, we've got the spread between new and used equipment values uh, on, on the y-axis, and, and, and we just plot it over time. Uh, you know, in bad periods, you know, you tend to be down here in the lower left-hand quadrant. Good periods in the upper right-hand quadrant. Uh, you know, we are here right now. So, so the spread between used equipment prices and new equipment prices are high. A and, uh, you know, profitability, if I go back four quarters, there's Q1 uh, 2016 at about 5.7%. Uh, you know, right now in Q1 17, uh, profitability was, was about 4.7%. So, so again, we're, you know, we're getting strong orders in a period uh, of, of fading uh, carrier profitability. And, and the net is, and, and, and I've got, you know, my, myself and I, uh, I've got a colleague uh, who also runs his own uh, tractor fleet utilization model. And, and, you know, my model says that there are about 100,000, at the end of 2016, there were about 100,000 too many class 8 tractors in the market relative to economic demand. My, my colleague, Jim Meal, who maybe some of you know, um, he, he thinks it's about 125,000 too many Class 8 tractors. So even into, into this, which, and, and the importance of tractors, uh, you know, I know you, some of you guys are like, uh, uh, does he realize he's talking to a bunch of people that care about trailers? Uh, you know, again, the importance of tractors is, is tractors drive capacity uh, and, and tractors and, and that capacity is what sets pricing and allows carriers to buy trailers. So, so I, 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 that's uh, one of the reasons why I, I, uh, I, I focus on this. We do think this, this, this situation cleans itself up uh, as we move into and through 18. Uh, you know, we, we do have the ELD productivity hit. Uh, we do have a positive freight environment. And, and we have below replacement tractor uh, utilization. So we do think trucker profitability has the potential to start to rebound into 2018 and be very strong in 2019 and 2020. Turning to the trailer model, I'm just going to go to the pictures. Uh, so, so we, we believe uh, right now there's, there's roughly uh, about 3.1 million total trailers in the United States. Uh, the average fleet age, uh, you know, after peaking uh, around 2009, 2010, is, is back to more normalized levels. Uh, I will touch on the second chart in, in just a bit here. Uh, you know, what does that look like? Uh, van type trailers are about 65, 66% of the market. If I add flats in, uh, we're about 75% of the market. Uh, the last quarter of the market are, are uh, uh, you know, the stray dogs and, and stray cats. So, so a lot of construction uh, related trailers, uh, tanks, and, and, uh, and, and, and grain type trailers. You know, call it, you know, commodity trailers, if you will. So turning to the dry van market, which I know is, is, is near and dear uh, to, to the hearts of, of strict trailer, uh, you know, our population right now is, is still well below uh, the peak that we had in, in the mid-aughts. We're, we're at about 1.7 million uh, dry van trailers. You can see, see the peak was, was about 1.85, so, so we're about 150,000 units below uh, the peak of about a decade ago. Uh, our forecast is for, for good demand. Uh, but you can see, you know, we've, we, again, we've normalized, you know, on the average age, and, and our forecast kind of normalizes the average age at about seven years. Uh, but you can see that, that, you know, 2010, 2011, this was a very old industry, uh, and, and I think there was, there, was, there was a lot of, like, underlying support for robust trailer drive-in, trailer demand um, is, as, as, we, as we look into this decade. Uh, and one of the things, and, and I was having this discussion uh, last night with one of my table mates, uh, but, but uh, you know, because we had such a crummy market for dry vans in, in 2008, in 2009, in 2010, 
uh, you know, that was one of the things that helped support demand over the past four or five years. You know, that there, there were no five-year-old trailers, there were no six-year-old trailers, there were no seven-year-old trailers. Well, you know, the problem is that 2008, 9, 10 is now moving into that nine, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old trailer as we move through the next few years. Uh, and, and what that does is, is our underlying replacement has, has been, you know, at a really a nice plateau uh, at, at about 130 to 135,000 units a year uh, because we had that, you know, kind of that, that hole in demand from 2008 to 2010. As those vehicle years move into their peak trade in years, uh, you know, we, we do see a deterioration in underlying replacement for new vehicles. Uh, so we go from this, you know, kind of 130,000 unit level where we are this year, which is that light blue bar, uh, you know, down to about 115,000 units as we start looking out towards the end of the forecast. Uh, and this is, this is just a picture of, uh, you know, this is, this is what our model uh, you know, kind of looks like. So uh, if you look at the total bars, these, that's, that's what was sold or what was shipped in every year from 1998 to 2016. Uh, the blue part of the bars are what our model says are still units in operation. The white parts of the bars are, are what our model says has died. And, and you can see, uh, you know, there's still, uh, you know, in, in the kind of 98, 99, 2000, there's still about 120,000 of those really old trailers in the market from those, you know, absolutely huge years we experienced. So I, I think there's, there's still a little bit of a tailwind um, on, on the, uh, on, on, you know, kind of pent up replacement demand in the marketplace, uh, but, but it is tailing off pretty fast. Uh, another way to look at this uh, in the dry van market is, is uh, you know, w what we've done here is just taken trailers sold in the last eight years relative to trailers sold in the last 16 years and just look at the market as, a, as kind of the late model trailers as a percentage of, of trailers. And, and this is dry vans and, and uh, you know, we have different years. I think for, for reefers we do, uh, I think we do, uh, you know, seven and, seven and 14. Uh, for flats we do 10 and 20. But you can see, uh, you know, because we didn't sell a lot of new trailers, um, we had a very undersold marketplace uh, in this, you know, kind of 2008 to 2014, 15 period. But look what's happened the past couple of years. Uh, you know, we're, we're now at, uh, you know, near peak levels of late model relative to total van trailer fleet. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a tougher sales market. And, and then my, my, my final dry van slide here, uh, at least, uh, you know, from, from modeled numbers, uh, is, is uh, looking at the dry van to tractor ratio. Uh, you know, the drop off in the, in the ratio, you know, the run up in the ratio w was, was due to just in time uh, becoming a thing in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Uh, the drop off in the ratio in the early 2000s was due to trailer tracking. Everybody finally was able to, to find out where their, uh, where their stray trailers were. And, and we've really seen, uh, you know, very consistent levels since. Uh, you know, we would argue uh, that, that because of e-commerce and because of, of the need to have high quality, frequent deliveries from, say, a distribution center to a fulfillment center, uh, it, it increases the need for trailer to tractor ratio. So we're, we're seeing a bump up in, in 2017, and we think that can be maintained uh, as, as, we, uh, as we look through the forecast. Current market, we'll, we'll just skip that and look at the pictures. So, so this is a chart, this, this chart, so the, so the green bar or green line on this chart is total trailer orders year over year uh, percent change. And, and you can you know, track that line. The, the black line is carrier income. And, and we use the publicly traded truckload carriers is, is who we use. Uh, we aggregate their data and, and this is what comes out. Uh, so the black line is, is carrier income. Uh, the green line is, 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 is new order activity for trailers. And you can see over time, there's a very, very nice correlation. I, I think it's like a mid 90s correlation uh, over time between these two series. And, and you look what happens in, in, the, uh, in, in the first quarter of this year. Um, Carrier profitability is cut in half, and uh, uh, trailer orders rise by 
It's just one of those things. It's like it just it just doesn't make sense. And I will say uh, that that uh, in in the class eight market, you know, we were seeing. Uh, if, if I go back to say the fourth quarter or the second half of 2016, we were seeing Class 8 orders running at a you know kind of a 200, 210,000 unit annual rate. Uh, through year to date April, uh, we saw Class 8 orders jump up to about a 280,000 unit run rate. Again, on not much change. Uh, the May preliminary order we got for Class 8 dropped us down to about a 210,000 unit. Uh, Order rates. So, so uh, you know what we you know we say you know one month doesn't make a trend, uh, but certainly something we've paid attention to. Uh, you know, turning to trailer markets, and I, I don't know why I didn't bold the uh, the, the three months SAR, uh, but but you can see uh, you know if you, if you just come all the way, I guess you know what, this is a dry van meeting, uh, but uh, but you know good you know relatively consistent numbers. If I look at you know 155 over the past 12, if I look at the the seasonally adjusted uh, April number at 161. Uh, you know, the past six months at a, at a 200,000 unit rate, uh, you know, our forecast for dry vans is about 180,000. Uh, you know, production has been below that because we did kind of slow production uh, into the end of this year. Uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, we've, the, the industry has built some backlog. Uh, just just one, one point to make uh, on, on seasonality in orders, and, and, I, and I realize this is a very wonkish point, and, and Charlie's, you know, looking at it as a watch saying, did. <laughs> Uh, but 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 that is and, and is, is, is I, I, w I would liken it to uh, yeah, retail sales at Christmas. Uh, you know you can't look at December retail sales ahead of Christmas and then look at January retail sales and you say, oh man, January was horrible. It's like well, you know, duh, because everybody bought stuff for Christmas. Uh, so so it's kind of the same with with trailer orders and and and, and so. In order to kind of read between the lines, we seasonally adjust the data. And, and you know, one of the things we know is in July, on average, orders in July are 30% below the average order month. In December, orders on average are 34% above the average order month. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we can say that in any given year, July and December, there's going to be about a 65% difference in orders, all other things being equal. So we seasonally adjust. So when we get that, that crummy number in July, uh, you know, we, we boost it up by 30% and say, okay, it's not so bad. In December, we get that huge number, you know, we don't jump up and down. We, we, we subtract 35% out of it, and then we determine, uh, you know, whether we should jump up and down. So just drive in orders, uh, and, and you can see that, you know, really, you can see the seasonal pattern. Uh, you know, playing out again and again each year. Uh, you know, the big fleets come into the market, place, place big 12-month orders, uh, you know, drive the order cycle up, and then, you know, you fall off into the summer, you know, fall off into the summer. Uh, you know, positively, uh, you know, looking at cancellations, you can see what happened in the middle of last year, but, you know, looking at where cancellations have been year-to-date, uh, very, very nice, uh, you know, the guys that have, have placed orders are happy with the orders they've placed. Uh, so, so I think the, you know, the situation is good. Uh, you know, one thing that's been very interesting, and, and you know, maybe it's, it's the Trump effect, uh, but, but what I've got here is, is kind of order season. So it's the seven months from September to March. The blue bars are 2015-2016 order season. Uh, so September of, of 2015, you know, 35,000, 32,000, 40,000. Uh, you know, you compare, uh, so September, October, November of 2016, uh, you know, 12,000, 22,000, November, up 36,000. Uh, and, and, and what we've seen over time is, is the difference in, in the cycles is, is shown on the, uh, on the, on the right-hand chart there, is, is we started out with a significantly different gap between the two order se the last two order seasons, but by the end of March, we ended up in exactly the same place. So, so I thought that was you know just just interesting uh, again uh, you know kind of kind of wonky stuff that, that we just love in our shop. Uh, so so uh, uh, you know looking at order backlogs, I, I've got uh, you know the to oop, uh, again I've got total industry backlogs over here. Uh, in total industry backlog to build ratio is about five and a half months. If I look at the dry van backlog to build ratio, uh, you know we're 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 down uh, you know I say right about there. So so you know we're we're down. Uh, you know, maybe 15 or 20,000 units on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, but the backlog to build ratio is very healthy at six months. So basically, the, what this says is, if we took no 
other orders this year, the industry could build at the April build rate for six months before they ran out of orders. So, so that's the way to read the backlog to build ratio. Uh, you know, production expectations on a total industry basis, uh, you know, running, uh, you know, kind of about 1175 to 1200 a day, uh, you know, relatively flat, uh, you know, through the, through the forecast period. Forecast summary, uh, so, so, you know, no sign of recession. Uh, you know, we do have some fading expectations that there's going to be anything big done. Uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, the, the, you know, one side of the Republican Party can't agree with the other side. Uh, you know, this, we, we were thinking at the beginning of the year, and we've been cutting our economic forecasts, because when President Trump got elected, we, we added 50 basis points to our forecast for this year and next year. And, and uh, you know, over the past four months, we've been taking that, uh, that higher expectation out of our forecast because of the inability uh, for, for Congress and the President to get anything done. Uh, you know, productively. Maybe, maybe they'll come through uh, and, and get it done, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 been a, it's been a tough road so far. Uh, so, so uh, you know, the, the you know, kind of post-election uh, tear that orders went on are extending a very long cycle. You know, we've, we've never seen, you know, four back-to-back -back years like we've seen, uh, you know, over the, the last four, including this one. Uh, you know, carrier profits, you know, I, I've talked about, you know, they're down. But, but carrier profits are down to, to like okay levels uh, relative to, uh, to history. Uh, you know, production starting to regain momentum. Backlogs are providing support. You know, you guys have probably already read this chart now. I'm reading it to you. Uh, and, but the cycle is getting long in the tooth. And, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that consideration, you know, even, even in a growing economy, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the good news is, uh, you know, we're, we're not coming, if, if you go over, you know, four really strong years and we go into a recession, it's going to get bad for the trailer industry because, as we saw, there's a lot of new equipment in the marketplace. Uh, but but if, if demand just tapers off in an okay, you know, this 2% GDP economy uh, that we've been living with for the past, uh, you know, seven or eight years, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to moderate into you know, it's, 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 it's not great, but it's okay. You know, so, so, you know, it's, you know, so the Great Recession, you know, you could argue the Great Recession was kind of followed by the, the great okay, if you will. Um, uh, so here's our forecasts. Uh, so our forecast right now, uh, you know, GDP this year at about 2.1%. Uh, a lot of that pull down came from, from the very weak uh, Q1, that 0.7 GDP number. Uh, you know, this was 2.9% uh, a couple of, uh, couple of months ago, uh, and, and getting back to kind of 2% trend as, as, we, as we look out into the future. Um, freight, you know, we, the machinery guys coming back, you know, there's, there's, there's expectation for good freight in the marketplace. Uh, you know, this is, this is just U.S. and just tractor retail sales. Uh, you know, the, the, the tractor market is slumping into this year. Uh, and, and a lot of that, in the, the strength in 2016 was selling units out of inventory. The, the Class 8 market, the Class 8 OEMs built stupid amounts of inventory in, in 2015, and they spent most of last year getting rid of inventory, which is, which is why 16 was as good as it was. Uh, you know, turning to the dry van market, you know, the, the, again, the consistency uh, of the market has, has really been, been amazing. And if, if, you know, we went back to, you know, 2011 and 12, this has been a great run uh, for the trailer industry. And, and, you know, three years in a row at, you know, 180, 180, and 172,000 is our forecast for this year. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're falling off, but we're falling off to a 150,000 unit market. The 150,000 unit market is, is, a, is, a, is a pretty good market. And, uh, you know, I've got some other numbers uh, on there for you all to look at. Uh, if, if, if anybody wants to give me their card, I can, I can send you a copy of the presentation, or, or you can probably uh, give Charlie a card and he can send you a copy of the presentation as well. And, uh, you know, with that, I've, I've uh, got some time for questions. Or first, thank you for, for your uh, attentiveness here. That's Yes. So what was that drive in number for the uh, third quarter of last year going into the uh, COVID virus year? That almost the very same uh, US drive in that we did. So this this forecast right here? Sure. So in September 
this was like 145. So we've we've had to uh, uh, we've had to push that number up a lot, and that gets back to that that just cratering of orders that we saw uh, in in the summer of last year, and that huge spike in cancellations. Uh, you know, of course, you know, <laughs> as is always the case with forecasting, you know, AKA guessing. Um, one of the risky things is is chasing the short term, and you get a you know you so so you chase the short term down. And then, you know, you get wet. And I would say if, if Hillary would have gotten elected, we'd have probably been golden with that 145 forecast. Just, just saying. Yeah, Charlie. So, so the question is, uh, the industry's added a lot of capacity uh, over the past 12 months, and, and how, does that, uh, how, does, how does that impact demand? I, you know, I, I think my concern, I, I, well, you know, first, I, th I think truckers tend to buy the right amount of equipment. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, with the peaks and valleys, uh, you know, sometimes they buy too much of the right amount of equipment, and sometimes they don't buy enough of the right amount of equipment. But, but I think, you know, just because the industry's added capacity, it doesn't necessarily drive the marketplace unless the OEMs, in order to fill that capacity, start discounting their product. And, and I think that's the risk because, you know, Hyundai added, you know, say 20,000 units of capacity, uh, Dane added five, uh, Vanguard added 10. Um, yeah, well, utilities, reefer plant, uh, you know, so I, I say that's, you know, more reefer as opposed to, as opposed to dry, but the utility's got a, you know, a 10,000 unit or 15,000 unit reefer plant uh, that, they, that they put down in Mexico. Um, you know, when, whenever, and, and yeah, I, I, you, you, whenever I see like, you know, Dane or, or utility adding capacity, uh, you know, I, I, I always feel like these aren't gonna be the guys that are gonna go get irrational on pricing. Uh, you know, they'll mothball a facility uh, bef before they, they uh, you know, get irrational on pricing. And, and I like the Vanguard guys, you know, so, so don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but, you know, those guys, you know, if they're out after market share, you know, then, then uh, and, and I, don't, I don't know that, but, but I would assume, uh, you know, these are guys that are trying to move up in the market, uh, you know, so do they push market share and, and so, so do they, uh, you know, squeeze margins in, in the industry. That, that's, that's a concern or you know, one of the things that we talk about in our shop. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think that's uh, yeah. That's that's you know an, another side of of uh, you know maybe a little bit higher tractor trailer ratios because uh, you know drivers uh, there there aren't very many drivers and 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 I could have gone off on a demographic tangent and and you know we could have talked about you know there's just not a lot of males rel you know 21 year old males relative to retirees coming up in the marketplace so uh, you know increasing your trailer to tractor ratio to to you know put more drop and hooks into your system to, to better utilize your driver's hours, you know, because drivers get paid by, uh, you know, miles driven, not uh, hours sat. So, uh, th yeah, that's a great point. Okay, well done. Well, thank you.